Hi, uh, I'm Sian. Thanks for joining me uh, in this talk. I know there's a bunch of talk going on in parallel right now, and I really appreciate your interest. Uh, I hope to make it interesting for you. Uh, today, I'll talk about a next generation extension model for enterprise applications. So, what we'll look at is uh, everything is moving into the cloud, uh, and enterprise software is no ex exception. So, uh, it, it, it's, it comes with a lot of problems when enterprise software is tuned to a customer's needs and it writes all sorts of extensions and deployed to the cloud. We'll talk about how we solve that using serverless. I will introduce you to a new software called Kima, uh, which is open source, followed by a demo. So again, uh, my name is Sion. I'm a developer with SAP Customer Experience. We deal with end-to-end -end, uh, e-commerce solution in a rapidly uh, scalable uh, cloud landscape. So cloud applications, uh, as they say, make the big ship move. This big ship which can be compared to a, uh, enterprise software. It has a bunch of uh, features to it, right? Uh, that's there for the reason. It's solving problems for big enterprises. But in order to tune it to for specific customer needs, uh, customer right extensions, and then moving this big ship gets, uh, 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 there's a big hassle uh, around it. So let's d dig deep. So a bunch of our customers are using on-premise model. So what happens is uh, they write extensions, they develop in their on-premise along with the extensions. A typical extension development life cycle would be you write the extensions, of course, and then you test it, and then you deploy. So one advantage to this process is you have close connection to the code. The developers had close connection with the code, meaning if there is anything breaking during deployment, uh, a developer could take a look or fix it if needed. This was all good, but then uh, upgrades was a problem because up extensions were tightly coupled to the core and you couldn't upgrade easily. Uh, and in the end, what happened was customers uh, was running primitive versions of the enterprise software. So this was not the way to go. So enter a cloud model. Oh, let me set the context. So in a cloud model, what happens? Developers would write the extensions, give it to the operator. Operator will package with, with the core of the enterprise software and then deploy it. But there are two problems with this. One would be the developer didn't have close contact with the code. So as a result, the operator would deploy in his own schedule. There can be time differences whatsoever. So there is no immediate feedback. And there's a long deploy time along with maintenance window because we are dealing with a beast of a software, right? And it's often bundled with other updates. It's done that, that way because uh, this process is expensive. You don't want to do that too often. And then the operator who is handling the core with extensions is having a varied set of extensions, right? There's a bunch of customers with different needs, different sorts of extensions. And that resulted in uh, snowflake deployments. Troubleshooting became a nightmare. And it was really hard to up update. So, We'll take a look what serverless is, and then um, I'll try to connect the dots uh, by solving the problem that I stated with Kima. So, as per martinfowler.com, uh, who has all the definitions of the latest buzzwords, uh, it serverless composed of three basic things. The first is an ecosystem of third-party services, which will work with client-side logic, and that all will be wired with remote procedure calls, which is hosted, so you don't have to deal with servers. But this is pretty obscure right now. Let's look at it pictorially. 
Okay, so this, that's a cloud in your left with a bunch of managed services. That can be authentication service, mail server, or even database service, which is used by a client logic, can be a Java, JavaScript single page application. Uh, imagine that a user needs to authenticate it so the client code can straight away use the authentication service from the cloud provider. And then comes this Lambda, which is the function of the fast as a service. So function as a service, there you would write all the backend code and mash them in order to serve the single page application. And in turn, it's going to use this bunch of uh, third party services uh, in the cloud. A disclaimer here is fast is not the same as serverless. So fast is just your backend service backend code running on servers which you don't have to take care of, but serverless is the whole ecosystem of fast, uh, third-party services, and your client code, all wired up together. So let me introduce you to Kima. This is open source, uh, and it's pronounced as Kima. It's a Greek word. It means waves, as in wave of the sea. So what happens in Kima is uh, the hexagon is the Kima, which is running on Kubernetes, and uh, the lambdas represent the functions in circles, and the hexagons are microservices. So what we are saying is we could extend enterprise software by writing either lambdas or microservices, which is running on Kubernetes, and Istio plays an important role where it provides a service mesh around all the services. Uh, even it has a pluggable policy uh, a layer which uh, enables you to control rate limits or access control quotas. And with Kubernetes, we get all the cloud native features like scalability or uh, fault tolerance, to name a few. And these are all isolated from each other. In Kubernetes world, there is pods, which is a group, which is a collection of one or more containers, and that way each lambda can be scaled or brought down without any impact to the surrounding. And now this enterprise software, which gets hooked to Kima through Applications Connector, and Application Connector is the secure channel from your enterprise software to Kima. In a true serverless world, it's always event-driven, where some events trigger your compute uh, stateless functions and do a certain job. And that's the reason we have uh, an event bus integrated with Kima. It's based on NAT streaming. And there, we, we, I try to show like the events flowing from the enterprise software to Kima to trigger these lambdas of microservices solving a problem. And next piece here, which is a service catalog. Uh, so we said we need a, an ecosystem of third-party services, right? So that's what service catalog enables in Kubernetes. Uh, we'll take a look uh, in, the, in, in detail in the next slide. So we have this console UI, which lets you manage all the resources in Kubernetes as well as Kima. Uh, like Kima uses a lot of custom resource definitions. So custom resource definitions in Kubernetes is a way to extend Kubernetes API in order to do a custom functionality. We use extensively to uh, do a certain piece of function in Kima. And you, you may use a graphical user as well as console uh, CLI to uh, do a certain job. Um, and this API gateway lets you uh, control all the ingress, egress into the cluster. So service catalog. Service catalog, uh, it extends Kubernetes API in order to use the applications uh, in order to make use of the third party services in your applications running in Kubernetes. And you could hook service brokers which are following open service broker API spec in order to list, uh, provision, and bind the services to your functions or microservices. 
And since it's well known uh, with all the renowned cloud providers, so essentially you can use most common uh, or the useful managed services in Kima to solve a problem. So let's zoom into the FAS in Kima a bit. So right now in Kima, we, we are leveraging Kubeless to, um, uh, to work as a platform, as a function as a service platform. So what happens is you write a function and then it gets stored as a custom resource definition inside Kima. And there is Kubeless controller manager, which kicks in and it creates deployment pods and services for that function. So a function, again, it's a pod running inside Kubernetes, uh, which is totally isolated from all other functions or microservices. Now, you may trigger the function in two different ways. The first one would be through HTTPS. Uh, you could expose the function outside the Kima cluster uh, in a secured way with um, HTTPS. Uh, in turn, we use a CRD call API and a bunch of um, STO CRDs as well to achieve this. Or there can be a trigger coming from outside, landing into NATs, or the even bus. It has a few more components. It's, the even bus is just based on NATs. And that's going to trigger the function to work. And finally, we would set the context, the context uh, using the service binding. So using the service catalog, we got to instantiate a service instance, which we will uh, bind to a Lambda or a microservice using service binding. And what happens is the connection details or the secrets gets injected to the Lambda function, and the user can just use it without knowing much uh, like the details about it. So a few aspects of operations inside uh, Kima. Uh, it comes with, uh, it is packaged with well-known uh, solutions like Prometheus Grafana for monitoring, for uh, logging we use OKLog, and for tracing Jaeger. And under the hood, it's all Kubernetes Istio, which is done. So what we're saying is a developer can uh, enjoy the cream, which is the built-in dashboards or the UIs to uh, track and debug the microservices. Uh, and we take care of the platform, which is running on Kubernetes Istio and open tracing. Logspot is used to feed the logs to OKLog so that it can be viewed in the UI. So let's look at the demo scenario. I have a recording for the demo, and I think that will never break for sure. OK, so what I have here, of course, I have a Kima cluster, uh, a Lambda, which is listening to an event. And that's going to, now this Kima cluster is in turn connected to this enterprise software. In this case, I'll be using SAP Cloud uh, Commerce C Cloud Enterprise Edition. And Lambda will be listening to an event called Order Created. And once this event gets uh, triggered, the Lambda uh, is executed, which in turn makes a call to the Commerce Cloud through OCC API and get details more about the order. And then it calls a microservice called HTTP DB service, which will, in turn, store the details in Azure SQL. That's a DB service uh, provisioned in Azure, uh, which will use Azure Open Service Broker for that. And this micro UI is used to view the order details, which will be fetching the records from Azure SQL using the microservice. So let's see it in action.
Okay, so these are the environments here. We are working with CF Summit EU. What this means is, right. So environment is a namespace in Kima, but with a few tweaks. So we have resource coders and others uh, enabled. We'll be working with CF Summit EU, and here we can work with a bunch of Kubernetes resources as well as Kima resources through the UI. Oh, this is really at the low. This is the administration tab. Okay, in the administration, you could download the cube uh, config and work in terminal. These are the bunch of service brokers already provisioned. I have Azure Broker with me and some other brokers. So here is a link to the Grafana dashboards, which we package. All right, so now let's see it in action. Okay, so we have a bunch of docs already integrated in the UI as well. It's there in the website too. Great, so now let's get into action. So remote environments. Once an uh, enterprise software gets registered to Kima, we use a remote environment custom resource definition to store the metadata of the connections. So I've already registered in EC default, the cloud commerce environment. In order to use that, I need to bind it to my namespace, which is CF Summit EU. That's right. And once it's bound, I can use the service catalog. Okay, so what happens here in the, once we register the enterprise software or the commerce cloud here, uh, it comes with two service in the service catalog. The first one is events, because we'll be listening to the events um, and reacting based on that. So we need to create a service instance uh, to use it in our environment. That's what we are doing here. We'll change the name just to make it short, otherwise it just generates a unique name every time. Okay, and the next piece is this guy. So what it does is the Lambda, when it gets triggered, it's gonna make a few a call to the enterprise software to get more details. So in order to get the red, uh, APIs from the enterprise commerce, we need to uh, create a service instance for that. So this is the whole API, and we'll be just using one endpoint to get the order details. Here we are binding it to the environment that we're gonna use. So essentially, we are creating two service instances, uh, one for the events and other for the API in order to use it in our Lambda. Okay, move on. Great, awesome. Okay, next comes the Lambda. I've already cre created the Lambda before. I'll just explain what we do it here. So first, we are trying to subscribe to an event here, order created uh, among this bunch of events which are available. And in the Lambda, what we do is, um, yeah, I'm gonna explain once it moves on. Okay, so this request get, we'll actually make a call to the enterprise software API to get more details. That's the first call, and the second call is to the HTTP DB service, which is a microservice deployed next to the function pod uh, to add the record to the Azure DB. That's, what, that's the call out here. We said the URL, the call is here, the post. And now, what we're doing is we're binding to uh, 
the service instance of that API in order to use it. What happens in the background is a service binding gets created, an event, um, an environment variable called gateway URL is present to be used in order to reach the enterprise software API. Great. I think we are set. So finally, there are three deployments in action here. The first one is this guy. It, it contains the function. And then the HTTP DB service, which inserts the record details to the Azure DB. And finally, the UI, which pulls out the information from the Azure DB. And the, this microservice is already exposed. This API section, this is exposed using uh, the URL in here, which we will access shortly. So of course, there are no orders right now. We will try to create an order in the enterprise commerce or the SAP cloud uh, platform. And then we, and then that order should be visible in the UI. Great, the order is created, which is 3109. And what happens in the background, the lambda gets triggered and everything, and we get to see it in the um, UI. And now, a few more details uh, on this schema console. We could expose a function using HTTPS in here, and this is an authentication service which is compatible with JWKS. Um, and in out of the box, Kima, we do provide an authentication service, but uh, technically you could have any authentication service which is compatible with JWKS hooked into Kima, and that's going to work in here. This is a token part if you want to uh, take the token and make it a call by yourself. OK, so this is the whole service catalog in detail. Since we have Azure Broker enabled, you see there's a bunch of Azure managed services already available to be used in Kima. But we use Azure SQL Database 12.0, uh, which is used in HTTP DB service in here through this service instance. That's all we are saying. Now, this is the Grafana dashboard, which is already packaged with Kima. This is a Lambda dashboard. We see just one data point, which was successful. Uh, it has response, success rate, response time, and request rate, and other stuff. Uh, but we, I have another function, which is stress, which has a lot more data points, and hence, the we can see some data coming in here. But it's not just that. We have a bunch of dashboards already packaged in Kima, from Kubernetes overall monitoring to uh, the Istio-related network overview. So, and a an user can create customized dashboards and save it. So this is the Kubernetes overall uh, overview. And then, uh, pods or nodes, or this is the nodes dashboard. So this is all packaged with Kima for now. And now, a request is reaching a bunch of microservices inside Kima, right? Now, debugging is a pr pretty big issue if we can't trace them. That's the reason why we have Jaeger already integrated with Kima. And this is the Jaeger UI. So what we see here is the first call came to connector. So the application connector, so the event, came through application connector to Kima. So that's the reason we see connector out here, followed by publish and push. 
those are the components of event bus, which in turn triggers the CF, uh, yeah, CF order service, which is the function, which in turn calls the EC gateway to fetch the orders. Uh, so the first REST call to the enterprise software. EC is a bit confusing term, like EC term is going away. It's called enterprise commerce. It used to be called, now it's called SAP cloud commerce. So we have still EC out here. That's it's the same thing. Uh, right, and this is the Lambda trigger followed by EC gateway and HTTP DB service. And everything is part of service mesh because uh, Istio is enabled, and this is possible using uh, Istio proxy, which is a sidecar to every deployment. Hence, we see Istio proxy in all the calls. Great. So that's it. Now, let me go back to my slides. Okay, it's still on. So what we want to take away from uh, today's talk, I want to leave you with how we decoupled the enterprise software, the extensions developed in enterprise software in a different platform. Now agility is back in the business because you can experiment, you can um, uh, try out few things in a fearless manner in Kima, and uh, the extension developers are in control of the code that they write. And SAP takes care of the core upgrades whenever possible, so in a way, we can move a lot faster than before. And everything is uh, characterized by highly cloud-native features, and we have deterministic deployments. By that, what I mean is uh, an operator now doesn't need to deal with third-party code. He knows his core. If anything goes wrong, that will be easier to debug than handling third-party code. And of course, it's secure with Istio and everything. So I encourage you to try this out today, if not. Um, it's available in GitHub. Uh, there's schema project.io. We have a bunch of uh, documentation out there. We are pretty uh, responsive in the community, community Slack channel and uh, active in Twitter. Peers are always welcome. Feedbacks, comments, just let us know. Um, thanks for your attention. And if you have questions, I can take right now. Uh, yeah, grab me in the conference. I can answer a few more questions or um, uh, discuss about Golang or distributed systems. Thanks.